What's going on everybody? My name is Chris and welcome to Linux Tech Geek. So in today's video, we are going to be installing Gen 2 Linux. Now, I already have a Gen 2 Linux video uh, in installation video here on the channel, but that video is like eight or nine months um, ago. And I, I wanna keep this content up to date. Not only that, but there was quite a few things I screwed up on in that video. Number one, um, I assumed that you guys, the new user, um, knew kind of what was going on. Um, I didn't go over every command that I was entering in the terminal. I didn't explain every single detail. Um, there was a lot of stuff in that video that I sort of rushed through, and that was because I had made a video before that one, and um, when I got to the end of the Gen 2 installation video, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. So um, I, I was getting a bit tired, and um, I just didn't explain every single little detail. But in this new user-friendly video, um, I'm going to be explaining every command. Um, I'm also going to assume that you guys, the new user to Gen 2, um, you guys don't know. Um, you know, maybe maybe you just heard of Gen 2 on a Reddit forum, or maybe you watched a YouTube video and you heard about Gen 2. Maybe a friend of yours recommended Gen 2. So this is going to be a beginner's guide to installing Gen 2 Linux. Um, I'm not going to be doing any kind of shenanigans in my make configuration. Now I will be going over a couple of things that I personally add to speed up compilation times, um, but I will explain every single detail to you guys and uh, yeah. With all that being said, now I will be installing this in a virtual machine I cannot record my desktop in OBS without doing this in a virtual machine. Um, I don't have like a, uh, I don't even have another computer and I don't have like a capture card in order to do that. Okay, so every command though that I enter in will work on bare metal. The only difference will be um, what hard drive that you're using, okay? your video card setup, um, and what make, uh, make flags that you set up. Everything else is exactly the same. Okay. So I, I do want to be upfront about that, but when we get to that point, um, I'll cover that. And also I'm going to try to put chapters in the, um, in the video that way for you guys that just need like a refresher, um, you can skip the introductory stuff that I'll be going over. Okay, so with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump over to the desktop and we will start the first step, which is getting the Gen 2 ISO. All right, so we want to install Gen 2. What's the first step? Well, the first step is going to be getting the ISO. Okay, so the way we do this, we up our favorite browser in that case it's firefox for me we head on over to the gen2.org website and then we click on downloads we're going to see multiple media right okay so what is what is all of this well the and 64 that generally that's going to be for us right the the normal user this ARM64, that's for a different um, architecture and everything. And they got a lot of different architectures. Um, but just understand that what you want to grab is the AMD64 boot ISO. Now, there is a couple of different ISOs. Okay. And you're going to be tempted... To grab the live GUI USB image. But. If you look at the timestamp. On that image. 
This is from 507, whereas the minimum ISO is from 604, which means that the minimum ISO is going to be newer than the lab GUI ISO. That matters simply because stuff gets updated all the time, right? The minimum ISO might have a newer kernel, which means it might support newer hardware if you guys are have newer hardware. Um, now, I understand that some people are a little nervous about using just the command prompt to do everything, um, but honestly, it's not that hard and it's not that big of a deal. And generally on the gen 2 um installation media the minimum installation cd is going to be newer than the lab gui uh simply put the lab gui has kde which means that they have to rebuild kde and everything and rebuild that iso image okay so i, I do want you guys to understand that so the first thing that we do is we click on the minimum installation cd we download the ISO. Now the next step is going to be burning the ISO to a USB stick. Okay. Now personally, I use um, a program called Blanca Etcher. Um, it works in Linux and it also works in Windows and Mac. So um, I think I'm spun it right. Blanca Etcher. Yeah, here we go. Belena Etcher. Um, Etcher ISO. All right. So you can go to etcher.belena.io. And you can get this program right here. You just download it. Run it. And then it will prompt you step by step on how to put the ISO on the installation media. After you get that done... You're going to have to restart your computer, get in BIOS, and switch over to boot from your USB stick or your CD-ROM or however, however you're booting this thing up, right? There's a lot of information on the internet in case that you don't know how to do this step. Um, I'm not really going to be covering this step because um, I need to, again, I need to be able to film um, going over this. Okay, so, um, but this is definitely a, a, a pretty good program, and uh, like I said, it does work. So, the next thing is, is we will be, let me pull up my virtual machine here. Okay, and I do apologize, but now like i said i'm going to be running this in a virtual machine so i'm going to do the begin installation it's going to do everything for me all right so we're going to do boot live cd The first thing that we're going to come to is load the key map. What is the key map? Well, the key map is for your, um, for your, like, uh, your country and everything like that. Okay, so I'm in the U.S., so I'll always select the U.S. key map. It does default to the U.S. key map. Okay, so now we boot it in. Great. What's the first step? Well, the first thing that we need to do when we boot into, into the ISO, we need to make sure that we have internet access. Okay? The way we do this is I like to type in if config, make sure I have a device. I have a device. Next thing we can do is we can ping google.com. So I like to do ping, C flag three. That means I want to just ping it three times. Google.com. And as you can see, we 
we sent out packets and we received information back. We have internet access. You need internet access. This minimum installation CD requires internet access. Okay, the Lab GUI installation requires internet access. Um, unfortunately, you can't install Gen 2 without internet access. Um, I do want to be upfront about that. Okay, so now that we have that taken care of, if you do not have internet access or if you are on Wi Fi, okay, so what I would do is type in if config. If you're on Ethernet, you should have an Ethernet adapter. In my case, it's going to be the ENP1SO or S0. Okay. If you're on Wi Fi, you can type in IWconfig. And that should pull up a Wi-Fi adapter for you. Okay. So there's a couple of different ways to connect to your router or to your modem using um, just a command prompt. The program that I personally use when I have to and when I'm on Wi-Fi is WPA Supplicant. And WPA Supplicant is pretty easy to use. Okay. Um, you will need to make a custom um, configuration file, but it's like five lines of code. It's super, super easy. In fact, I might actually be able to find it right now for you guys. Um, so what I like to do is go to uh, Arch Linux and then WPA Supplicant, and I'll show you the exact line of code I use to um, get Wi-Fi going uh, on the uh, command prompt here. This is the line of code that you're going to you're going to use right here. Okay? So you're going to just make a text file. All right? So you're going to get back over here. Okay? And then you can use nano whatever, right? Okay? And then you can call it network. And then you can do network uh, equals SSID um, my network my network name now the SSID needs to be the SSID of your router okay this is just an example okay and then PSK equals uh, which is called code okay that's going to be your router's password okay you're going to close it you're going to write it, and then what I would do is WPA supplicant minus I device name. So it would look something like this. So if I, if I had WLAN0 as my device name, that would be it. Then I would do minus C network. Minus C, what that is, is what configuration file to use. And then I would use minus B. Minus B, what minus B does is it puts it in the background. Okay? After you run that, then what you would do is, and if everything worked, it would tell you if your um, network, uh, if your network card associated with the router, what I would do is DHCP. CD, and then you, whatever your device name is, right? And what DHCP CD does is it gets a IP address. If everything goes well during that process, then you can do the ping google.com. If you receive information back, you're good to go. Okay. If you do not get to that point, I advise you to do a little bit of research on WPA supplicant. Maybe you mistyped something. Um, but that's personally how I would handle Wi-Fi um, using the uh, PTY here. Okay? So, speaking of Gentoo, we got Wi-Fi, oh, or we got internet set up, right? So, we're in pretty good step right now. All right. Next step is we need to get the handbook, right? Because we don't know how to install this thing. So 
let me find the handbook here. Click Gen 2 Handbook. Okay. And now we want the AMD 64 handbook. Remember, we are using AMD 64. So we click the AMD 64 handbook. Okay. Here we go. So we've chosen the right installation media because we're installing the uh, Dimensum ISO. We've configured the network. Okay. Now we need to go prepare the disk. Okay. Now they have a table here showing you the disk. But how can we translate that information over to the actual installation media? Well, we can do LSBLK. LSBLK. What that will do is that will tell you what the uh what drive that you're using so in my case i have sda and you can see i i gave it 75 gigs more than likely you'll have um a lot bigger hard drive um, this is just a virtual machine for me so um, but i did give it 75 gigs okay and it will also tell you um, what else that you have on your system Typically, if you have a SATA drive or an SSD, it's going to be called SD whatever, right? SDA, SDB, SDC, whatever. If you have a, the newer uh, NVMe chipsets, um, which is like the little, they look like RAM hard drives. Um, those are going to be called NVMe uh, drives, okay? Personally, on my system, um, I have a NVMe drive and also have a SATA drive, okay? Um, and then um, the older hard drives, which I don't think anybody really uses anymore, uh, will be called HDAs. So, but run that LSB okay, okay? Figure out what drive you got. So, our case, we're going to be using SDA. So now we can go through the handbook and we can read about the, the GPT and how to um, write a partition table and everything. Now for this installation, we are going to be using UEFI. Simply put, most of us these days are running UEFI. Um, if we're not running UFI, it's because we set up the BIOS to not use it. Um, but since this is a beginner's installation, we are going to be using UEFI. And I'm going to assume, assume most of you are going to be running it as well. Okay. Um, with UEFI, we have to run a GPT partition table. Okay, um, I believe, yeah, I believe that we do have to run GPT. Um, so they give you a default partition uh, scheme here, okay? Now, you don't have to take this partition scheme to heart, okay? Um, partition your drive the way that you want to partition your drive. The only thing that we have to do since we are using UEFI, is we have to make our boot UEFI. We can't make it extend to, extend for, um, and we have to actually make a separate boot uh, partition. Okay? So, there's a couple of different ways that we can go about doing this. Um, the, um, the installation media, or the installation uh, handbook recommends that we you can we can use F disk. I think we can use C F disk as well, but because they recommend F disk, we're going to be using F disk as well. Okay, so how do we do this? We do F disk. 
dev, SDA. Remember, SDA is our hard drive in our case. You're going to be using your hard drive. Okay. Hit enter. And then we can do M for help. Okay. So M. Let me pull down that so you guys can see a little bit better. Now, we have all these commands. Um, we can print the partition table. Okay. We don't have anything in that partition table. We need to set up GPT as our create a new label. Okay. So we need to do G. So we created a GPT uh, disk label. Okay. Now we can create our partitions. So type M again for help. So I'm going to do how do we list, how do we create a new partition? Um, we do N, add a new partition, okay? Now, we're going to say default 1. That's personally where I like to put boot. Okay, first sector, hit enter. Last sector, this is going to be the size of the um, the hard drive or the partition rather okay so um i do so i like to do um it recommends that you do 256 megs i believe i personally just give my boot one gig one gig is plenty big enough and it's not going to hurt anything so i do one g okay now we print, and you can see we got SDA1, the size of it is 1 gig. Now, what you do with the rest of this, um, with the rest of your um, partition scheme, it's kind of up to you. Um, some of you might want a different uh, home home partition some of you might just want to use the rest of it is root some of you even might want to use swap what i'll say about swap is if you don't have a lot of memory um then it is recommended that you use a swap partition uh however these days most computers uh, i really don't feel like you need a um a swap partition and um you don't need any other partitions except boot and root for in order to boot up into Linux. So all I'm going to be using is, um, well, I'll, I'll give it a swap. I'll, I'll give it a, a small swap. Um, so I'll do in partition number two, and then I'll just give it... Um, I know, I'll give it, I'll give it, I'll give it two gigs. It don't matter. Okay. And then partition three, we're going to be, that's going to be root and I'm going to give it everything. So we do first sector and then instead of entering in something on the last sector, we just hit enter and now that'll fill out the remainder of the uh, disk. Hit P to print, and there you go. So you can see that's kind of our partition scheme, right? Now, we can do M again for help. A new partition, space, partition. Yep. Okay, we're good. So hit W to write. It wrote it out. Now we need to make our file system. Okay. Now... Let me pull up the manual here. So this is going over this is going over partitions, how big, 
Um, we talk about we talked about swap, right? Now this is the big one because because we are using EFI, we have to make an EFI um, file system for our EFI uh, partition. Okay, and the way we do this is we do make FS. So we do make FS. Bfat or fat. They recommend fat, capital F, 32, and then the drive, okay? Now, our drive, or our partition is going to be SDA1. SDA is the hard drive, and 1 means partition 1, right? Swap is partition 2, root is partition 3. So just remember that, and if you do still need help remembering that, you can do LSBLK, and now LSBLK will display your your partition table. Okay. So make FS uh, fat thirty two deb SDA one. Okay. So that wrote that out. And now we can look and see how we'll we want to um, how we want to do the rest of our um, file systems. So there's a lot of different file systems. Um, well, I'm not really going to be covering ButterFS and how to set up that type of stuff um, in this video. This is meant more for a this is a noob friendly uh, video. So. What we're going to be sticking with is extend four is our root partition, and then um, we do need a um, swap partition for our um, our swap. Okay, so we can do make fs extend four dev sda three. Because SDA3 is going to be our root. And that's going to write that out. And then we can do make swap dev SDA2. Remember, SDA2 is going to be our swap. And then we can do swap on dev SDA2. Okay, and that's going to turn swap on for us. And you can see in the manual, we just typed in exactly what pretty much the manual told us to type in. Um, so now, we need to mount the root partition. Okay? So the way we do this is make dir, and then we can do parents, mount, gentoo. And now we can mount the um we can mount the root the root partition to this directory so we do mount gen2 now to see if we mounted it correctly we can do df minus h and you can see Dev SDA3 is mounted on Mount Gentoo, just like the book said. Okay, and it will show us our available disk disk space and everything like that. So now what we need to do is we need to go over here to stage three. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to check the date. Check the date. Checking the date is very important. It might not seem like an important detail because most computers keep your um, the date and time automatically, but when you're dealing with ISOs and everything, they could be using different different time zones, and um, it can uh, it can kind of screw you up. So check the date. It is very important. Okay. So I'm going to do date. 
so my date looks correct. I'm going to check my time. And that says 22. It is not 22. It is not 10 o'clock for me right now. This is why I need to check the date, right? Um, right now for me, it is 622. Um, everything is in military time, so... Now, they recommend that you can use this crony D command, okay? But they also say, hey, um, it's going to reveal a IP address um, to crony's, uh, you know, to their NTP server, which is the network time protocol server. Um, we're going to do this manual setup here because I do want to, I want to show you guys how to do it manually okay so it's date and then i believe it's month so today it's june the fifth which is oh six oh five okay um june oh five and then i think it's I forgot. It's month, date, hour, minute, and year. So month, date, hour. Um, so 16 is 4 o'clock. 18 is 6 o'clock. So it's for me, it's going to be 18, 24. Okay. And then the year uh, 2023. That looks correct for me. Okay, so now you can see why it's important to check the uh, check the date. Not only that, but when you're grabbing stuff from the uh, from Gentoo's website, like the tarball and everything, you do want to make sure that you have the uh, correct time, um, especially when you do an emerge sync. Okay, so that's how we check the date, and that's how we set it manually. You can run this crony d minus q command. Probably not gonna, it's not gonna hurt anything, but if you are concerned with privacy and everything, then uh, just be aware that it will display your IP address and everything. Um, but if you set it, if you set it manually, just do month, day, hour, minute, and year, just like I did, and uh, we'll get the correct date. Uh, the next thing in the handbook is talking about the multi lib. What multi lib is, is having, um, it's having 32-bit applications and 64-bit applications on your system at the same time. Um, you can go pure 64. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, or you can do that whole multi-lib thing. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what I use on my system right now. I think I'm just doing 64-bit. Okay. So the next stage, or the next thing in this installation is we need to go and grab the stage tarball right so the way we do this is change directory to mount gen 2 okay now <laughs> if you are doing this on one computer you're probably asking yourself well, how the hell am I going to grab this stage tarball? Um, or even read the handbook. How am I going to read the handbook and grab this stage tarball at the same time without, you know, um, point it up, you know, in, in multiple, either on another computer or your phone or whatever, right? Well, I'm going to show you something. So what we can do... Now, for you guys, you can hold Control Alt, and I believe it's either the Function key or so the F key, or it's Control Alt one, two, and three. I can't quite remember that command. Yeah, it is, it looks like it is the F keys. Now, for me, I need to do a little shenanigans because I'm in a virtual machine. I need to send a virtual command over. Okay, so. What I could do is I could do Control Alt F2. That's going to switch us to another TTY. 
Okay, so if you're on one computer, if you're on one system, this is a good option for you. That way you can keep your handbook on one TTY and then you can do your work on another TTY. Or what you could do is you could pull up the handbook on your phone, follow it like that. Um, there's many different ways that you can kind of get this thing going. Um, if I was using just one computer and only had one monitor, uh, I would just do the TTY thing because it works. Okay, so I, I did want to throw that out there for you guys because, you know, I know some of you guys are running on just one, one thing. Okay, we need to grab the stage, tar, uh, the the stage three tarball. Okay, so what we could do is there's a couple of different programs, there's a couple of different web browsers inside of um, like a terminal that we could use to grab this. So we could do links like that. I believe they got links. No, they don't have links installed anymore. They used to have links installed. In fact, on the handbook, as you can see right here, they actually say links right here. But, um, yeah, they don't have it installed anymore. Huh, okay. But they do have the other one. I do know the other one. So the other terminal uh, web browser is called links, again, but L-I-N-K-S. Okay, and this one does work. Okay. So, how we use this program is you hit G for URL, okay, and then you can type in gentoo.org, and this is terminal based, so um, let me minimize this over here to show you guys. Yeah, so this is, like I said, this is terminal based. Okay. And then you can go to downloads. And go down to this stage archives. Okay. And you can kind of read at the bottom there where it's telling you the... Um, you know, it's telling you the ISO and everything like that. We don't want to grab the ISO. We want to grab the OpenRC tar.xz. Okay? The way we do that is we go to it, and you can hit Enter. And then it will say, what do you want to do with this? Well, we want to save it. Okay? And then it's going to ask you the name to save. And we hit OK. And then I already downloaded it. Wow. Okay. That was kind of quick. Um, but yeah. And then you can hit Q to quit. Okay. After it gets done. And then you can type in LS to verify that it is on your system. There it is for me, stage three, okay? So the next step is we need to unpack this, um, but we also need to, the way that we unpack it, we need to um, have some kind of uh, permissions and everything. Um, I believe that's what this next step will be, okay? So, yeah, they like to, they tell you what every command is. I'm not really going to go over it, um, but... I, I kind of don't quite understand what everything is. I mean, I, I know what some of the uh, some of the stuff is, but I don't know what the X adders and include. I don't know what all that does. Um, I do know the preserve is to uh, preserve permissions and and all that. Um, and which we do need to we need to enter in this command exactly the way that it says to do it. Okay. So, XP, BF, and then we can do stage, and then you can type in ST and then hit tab, and it'll automatically write the remainder out for you. 
and then and we need to do x atrs include equals star no it's star dot star <laughs> almost screwed that up and then numeric owner and then hit enter and it's going to unpack all of this stuff for us okay it unpacked everything do an ls and you should see the um every, all the directories filled out so next we need to set some default um compile flags okay this is the big thing in gen 2 okay the the step that we're about to get into is the biggest thing in gen 2 if we do not set our compile flags right, it's going to take forever to install programs on Gen 2. Okay? So this is a very, very important step. And you can see they do give you some examples and everything to, uh, to follow. And uh, I use this March native flag as well. Okay? So what we need to do is we need to do nano or via I'm still doing the challenge right now so I'm going to be using nano so I can do etc portage actually no 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 we need to make sure that it's on the mount gen 2 not the ISO so we can do nano minus w and then I'll put the dot uh the uh, dot slash and then I'll do etc portage make dot com okay so we can do common flags and then we can do right here we can do march equals native okay and what this is doing this is going to set gcc which is the compiler it's going to it's going to take advantage of your cpu's architecture okay and um that's a whole nother video in itself you can read all about you uh you can read all about the uh, gcc flags if you're a big nerd like me um but pretty much you're you're just taking advantage of whatever um whatever cpu stuff that you have okay um the next thing is we need to set up um how many how many cores or parallel compilations are we going to give emerge the way we do this is we can do make ops and then minus J. Now the handbook says J4, but this isn't correct, okay? You need to know how many cores your processor has. Now, on this virtual machine, I gave it, um, I think I gave it 16 cores or 10 cores or something. Um, and I have 32 gigs of RAM. However, on this virtual machine, I only gave it 16 gigs of RAM. Okay. So, you need to set it to however many cores that you have on your processor. But each core would take up, I think it's 2 gigs of RAM. Yeah, yeah, right here. So, so it says right here so a j6 requires at least 12 gigs of ram okay so it's whatever the number times that by two and that's that's what you get right so if you had 32 gigs of ram you could do j16 
if you had, um, you know, I wouldn't do J16. If I had 32 gigs of RAM, I would do J12. All right, because you want some RAM for other applications. Um, this will eat up a lot of RAM when you're installing programs. But the more memory you give it, the faster it goes. That's just the way. That's just the way it works. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is, I think I gave it. I gave myself 16 gigs. I'm gonna do J8. I mean, well, actually, I'm gonna do J7. J7. J7 is fine for me. Okay, and that's going to eat up 14 gigs of RAM, which is kind of a lot. Now, there is another thing that we can do. This is not in a handbook or anything like this. This is something that um, you have to do some research on, okay? But it does, um, it does speed up things, and this is personally what I have in my configuration, okay? Now, like I said, this is not, this is not a mandatory thing or anything like that, okay? And it's not, it's, it's not in a handbook. Um, let me pull up my notes. We can do futures equals... Okay, we can do features equals, and then we can do parallel, P-A-R-R, -R, no, P-A-R-A-L-L-E-L, -L -L. parallel, parallel fetch, okay, and then parallel install, okay. What parallel fetch is going to do, it's going to fetch everything faster when you go to um, go to install programs. Okay, and parallel install, of course, it's going to use it's going to help the process out. It's going to speed things up. I don't know by how much, honestly, um, but I do personally use this in my config, and uh, it, it does seem to speed things up quite a bit. Okay, um, and if you want. A little fun thing in your thing, you can do something called candy. Um, and this is, um, it just adds some bling when you do like an emerge, whatever. Okay, and you, you'll see in a second. Um, but, yeah, I I would recommend you, you adding these um, to kind of help out stuff. But you don't have to, like I said, it... it there's there's no reason there's just no reason not to um anytime we can help out installing programs from source um then uh I'll, i personally like to take any advantage i can get okay next thing let's write it out how do we do that control x and then if you use a nano okay um so let's write it out and then we should be going to the next section of installing the base system. Now, <clears throat> there's this mirror select command. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do the mirror select command. Um, I'm not going to do it on this video. If you do end up feeling like that um, it's taken a long time to pull down, uh, dependencies and everything and applications, then you could run it after you get done with the base install, but you don't have to run, um, you don't have to run that command. We do need to run this though. We need to make a mount gen2 etc portage repos dot file. Okay. So we do make directory. Parents, mount gen2, etc portage, repos.conf. And now we need to copy over mount gen2, user, share, portage, config, repos. We need to copy it to mount. Gen2 etc portage re, repos gen2 
Okay. And now we can cat that command, or we need to cat that file to make sure that it is everything. Um, everything's correct. Okay. Now what this file does right here, it um, it just tells the system how it's going to pull down um, the the repos and everything, and where it's going to put all of the repos on your system so you can see that bar db bar db repos gen2 um that's going to be the directory and then the sync type uh it's going to be using rsync now there is a way to set that sync type to use git instead of rsync but that's beyond the scope of this uh video if you do want to figure that out, though, I do have a video on how to do that here on the channel. So definitely check that out. Um, and uh, it will, again, speed things up. Uh, but you do need Git installed in order for that to work. Okay. So the next thing with the handbook, it says we need to copy the DNS info. Okay. And what we're doing right now is we're copying the DNS stuff. So that way when we to root into our base, um, our, our install here in a second, we'll still have internet access. If we don't copy this DNS info information, when we to root inside of our, um, inside of our install, we won't have internet. Okay. So we, we need to, uh, we need to do this. Reference. I copy. I don't know why I can't never spell this. Reference. <laughs> Mount. Mount Gen2 ETC. Okay. So we got that. Now. We are going to be mounting all the stuff from the live environment we're going to be mounting it onto our uh, file system here inside of our um, our base install okay um so we we do is mount types proc proc Mount Gen2 proc mount rbind sys mount Gen2 sys what oh shit okay I screwed that up okay and then we need to make our slave mount gen2 sys mount our bind dev mount gen2 dev mount <laughs> make our slave Mount Gen2 dev mount bind run mount Gen2 run and then mount make slave mount Gen2 run. Okay, we need to copy all uh, copy that verbatim. Um, and well, like I said earlier, what that does is initially when the live ISO it boots up, it it has a lot of our um, like our, a lot of our hardware support and everything. Um, like the kernel reads all that information. Okay, so what we pretty much did is we copied everything that's on the live ISO and we mounted all that information to 
our cherooted environment. Okay. Um, now, right here, we don't really have to do any of this right here because we're not making um, like a separate tempfs uh, partition and doing any kind of weird things like that. And uh, we're not use we're using the actual uh, Gentoo Live installation media. Uh, if you was not using any of the Gentoo Live installation stuff, you may need to do this uh, for permissions. Okay, so entering the new environment. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to cheroot inside of our new system. Okay. So, the way we do this is root mount gentoo bin bash. Okay, now you see our prompt, it changed there, right? We need to do source etc profile. We're going to source our bash rc. And then this export ps1, you don't have to do that. The only thing that that does, it changes your prompt, okay? Now, if you want to have a virtual, a virtual like reminder that hey, I'm in my chi a cherooted environment, you can do that. I'm not really going to do it. Um, it's just it, it doesn't do anything, okay? But what we do need to do is we need to mount the boot partition. So we do the mount. Dev SDA1 because remember our boot was SDA1 and then we need to do slash boot. Okay. If you had any other partitions like home, whatever, okay, this is the time right now where you need to mount those. Um, the next thing we need to do is we need to do this emerge web sync. And what this is going to do, this is going to fetch um, the, it's going to get a snapshot of the Gen2 uh, repositories. Now, you can see we got some news. Okay, so we can do eselect news read. Okay, uh, this is, this can be pretty good information um, later on. Uh, the developers on Gen2 do do a pretty decent job of letting the the end user, which is us, know that um, they're changing the way that some packages are set up. Um, now, the next step is we're going to do this emerge sync. Before, we just got a snapshot with our sync, but now we need to do we need to do this emerge sync so we get a up to dated um, web sync or our up-to-dated portage um like an up-to-date version okay so we do a merge sync now that emerge sync command that's the equivalent if you guys have ever used um you know arch that's the equivalent of doing uh pac-man uh sy Okay, or uh, apt um, apt update for uh, uh, any kind of Debian uh, base distribution or Ubuntu or whatever. Okay, this is the equivalent of doing that. So you can see it's it's pulling in all of the new packages and everything like that. Okay. It's not installing them, it's but it's pulling in the new e-builds, okay? The next thing is choosing the right profile. Now, I, we are, we are going to be using, um, I'm going to be showing you guys how to set up Xorg on this video, and I'm also going to be showing you guys uh, how to set up like XFCE. Or something. We're not going to do KDE or GNOME or anything because those those are pretty big programs and that would take quite a long time to install. But XFCE and stuff, um, I'll, I'll show you guys how to, to uh, install that um, as well as set up uh, XORG and all of that stuff. So um, 
we do need to set up a default profile so we can do e e-select uh e-select uh profile list okay now you guys may be tempted to switch to this desktop profile right here you don't have to okay you don't have to you can if you want to um it's not going to hurt anything the what this profile thing does is it will set some default stuff in your etc make configuration it'll set some default stuff for you um to kind of help you out you know what let's go ahead and do it because this is a noob friendly video let's go ahead and do that because um it, it kind of I, I guess it kind of makes sense to, to go ahead and do that most of you guys are going to want a desktop profile in a way so so the way we do this is we do e select profile then we do the set and then we pick whatever one we want okay so we're not going to be doing uh we're not going to be doing gnome gnome anything we're not going to be doing plasma we're not doing system d no multi-lib the one that i kind of i'm looking at that i want is the is number five the desktop stable profile okay so we can do set profile set five okay and we can verify that it's set if we do the list again and you can see the little star showing that we we set it okay now we need to update world okay and this is going to take a bit <laughs> generally though when you are um when you're doing a a fresh install of gen 2 whatever you can keep it on just the stable okay it's not going to hurt anything and you can still install x org and all that stuff later okay um but if you do switch over to this uh, desktop profile, just understand that this next step, this may take a little bit longer than what it would without setting it to desktop. Okay? So the way we do Emerge World is we do Emerge. And then they like to do the Ask, but I do um, just do AV. And what AV is, is ask, and then it's also verbose, okay? So it's going to ask you, do you want to install these packages? And then V will show you guys when it's installing, okay? And then we're going to do update. Deep. New use. At. World. This is how you install, this is how you update your gen 2 linux distribution okay this command right here um this is the equivalent of pacman syu this is also the equivalent of doing apt app what is app get or app install upgrade or whatever it is for uh um debian so hit enter now you can see the little I don't know if you guys seen it, and this is kind of cool, but, um, so, watch at the bottom. You see how it's color? Like, you got those colors right there? That's what that candy, that thing that we set in futures is, when I set candy, that's what that does. Okay? So, we got a lot of programs, um, that we need to install. Like I said, that's because we set a desktop um, profile if we did not set a desktop profile this would be not very not very big okay it'd be like I don't know like 10 programs okay so we can do yes here this is going to take a bit what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause this video because I do not want this video going five hours long um, or however long this shouldn't take that long to to install here um but it is going to take a bit so when this gets done i'll bring you guys back and then we'll continue the uh process well that got done so the next thing that we need to do is we need to run this emerge depth clean command uh, what this is going to do is this is going to clean up any dependencies or anything that's left behind in the system um, 
We didn't have anything. So according to the handbook, the next thing that we need to do is we need to edit our make.configuration file. So etc portage make.conf. And we need to use some default use flags. Okay. This is another big feature of Gen 2. So what this allows you to do is each program that you install here on Gen 2 has a set of use flags, right? So some programs might have um they might use audio um or they might use another library for various reasons right what you can actually do on gentoo is you can set um you can set these use flags per package or you can set global use flags that the whole system will um, abide by right so in the etc make configuration file this is your global uh this is your global file okay so everything that you set in here the whole system will re will respect now you can do this um you can set use flags individually per program i do have a video on how to do that here on the channel so um if you guys are interested in learning um that type of stuff then i i really do advise you to watch that video because um, it will help you understand what use flags are and how to uh, how to manage them. Okay, so what we need to do though is we're going to just we're going to remove some uh, default use flags. Um, so I don't want gnome on the system, so I'm going to say minus gnome. I'm going to say minus KDE. Um, we want also, and we want pulse audio, right? Um, these are some, just some defaults that we can set, like I said. Now, we can add a lot more to this list. Um, I personally only, I like to keep this list a little small in my make configuration file, and then I like to set use flags per package. So, let's go ahead and write that out. And now we need to do this CPU flags. And what this does is, um, this is a package to set some more uh cpu uh, like architecture stuff so um we can do cpu id to cpu flags say yes and i'll show you what this program outputs so this is what it will output um now we can take these cpu flags and we can stick these in our make configuration file or we can do what they're doing here is and they're going to set it um in the uh, package.use it doesn't really matter how you do it um but this is a a pretty important step again um cpu id to cpu flags and that is a long and convoluted easy etc portage package that use cpu flags okay cool and now if we we cat that we can see exactly what it um what it wrote there we go now that we have that um it's talking about some default variables and stuff we ain't gonna worry about this video cards variables just yet um we'll do some of the um other stuff in our make configuration file when we get ready to install x and i'll show you guys step by step on how to do that um but we do need to set our license now license it is um you can set your license however you want, okay? I I, I personally accept all license on my system, um, but Gentoo does allow you to set different licenses. 
Um, so if you don't want, if you want a, a pure GNU system here on Gen 2, I, I believe you can do that. Um, and different license agreements. Um, this is going to be your preference. It really is because I don't want to tell you to accept all licenses if you don't believe in all the licenses. Um, it, it's just how I do it. Um, but the way you do it is you accept license variable, right? And then you do equal. And then what I do is star. Okay. Now they have some, um, they have some examples. So, so you can do, um, and here's all the license group names. So they got free, they got binary, reduce, reduce distributable. Uh, they got the EULA, um, Free Software Foundation, um, GPL, just, uh, there is a lot of different licenses here on Gen 2 Linux. Um, but, read through that, and figure out which license, if you want to accept all licenses, like I do, just make sure it, uh, you have the star there. <laughs> okay, um, next we need to do the time zone. Like I said, time is always important, so we can do ls user share zone info, um, America, that's where I am, and then Kentucky, Louisville, okay? So that's the, that's the time I'm going to be using, the, uh, the Eastern time, and then we need to echo this command out, so... America slash Louisville. L O U I S B O. And then ETC time zone. Just like that. Um, just make sure you put your time zone in. And then we need to merge. Config sys libs time zone data or data a m e r o e r jesus i can't even spell america right shame on me shame a m e r i c a so that didn't work for me because I didn't spell America right. <laughs> um, but you can see that we just entered that config uh, time zone data again. And uh, now it actually wrote that stuff in. Um, we need to configure the locale. So we need to have locale set. And the way we do this is nano etc locale dot gen okay and then we need to have at least one u one utf8 locale set um okay it's uh and then we need to generate that that locale the way we do that is locale hyphen gen now it's going to generate with whatever was in that list and now we can do locale, e-select locale list, okay? And you can see right now we have the UTF-8 locale selected, but we have the C UTF-8 locale. I want to set the um, US UTF-8, okay? And now it's going to ask us to, um, to resource our bash rc so we can just do source or we can run that command that it tells us to do either one of them is okay they both do the same exact thing oh and then we need to environment update okay everything is working next up the kernel now we need to do before we install the kernel we need to install the linux firmware package now what this package pretty much does is um it will certain um certain hardware requires additional patches in order for it to work 
So this is what the kernel, um, this is what the firmware package pretty much does. And then they also got different micro codes and everything like that. Um, so, uh, certain hardware, again, might need different micro codes. Um, there's the Intel micro code, and then there's an AMD micro code, I think. No, 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 no. So, um, I'm actually wrong. I do apologize about that. If you're running AMD, use the Linux firmware package. If you're running Intel, Run the Intel microcode package. That's my fault. I didn't. Uh, I didn't fully read there, but it pretty much says it right here with the uh, microcode. Okay. Now, kernel. This is the big. This is the big one, right? This is your system. For a new Gen two user, I recommend you using a binary distributable kernel okay use a bin kernel um now later on in your gen 2 experience or your linux experience and if you want to fool around with a um a sourced based kernel and you want to configure this thing and do a custom kernel then by all means go ahead and do it but for a new Gen 2 Linux user or a, just a new Linux user in general, I recommend you using a binary kernel. The reason I do is because binary kernels tend to have pretty much everything that you're, you, you need in order for your system to function properly. Okay. The problem with doing a custom kernel is you really, really need to know your hardware in order for the drivers to work properly. Okay, um, and then there's a hybrid kind of approach, and that hybrid approach is using something called Gen Kernel. What Gen Kernel does is it uses sourced code kernel, but it's a script, and what it does, it reads the .dot config file from the um, from the ISO that's that we booted up. Um, you can use that as well, um, but just understand that that's not perfect either and you know sometimes um i've i've had problems with gen kernel before new years new users use a binary kernel advanced users um you know if you're an advanced user you're probably not watching this video anyway but you know you could run a uh a source based kernel then there's some other kernels there's there's the zion kernel or xeon kernel zen kernel um there's a quite a few kernels here on gen 2 but um i'm just gonna stick with a binary kernel for this install it's the easiest it doesn't take that long and it's the most safe okay so the way that we install this is we can do um emerge well if i can Get over here. We do a merge AB sys kernel gen2 kernel bin. Bin stands for binary. Okay. And you can see it's going to install this stuff. And the nice thing also about a binary kernel is it doesn't take that long to install. Um, if you install a kernel from source, you're going to be waiting quite a while, even on a big, beefy machine, um, to install the kernel. And then, again, you're not guaranteed that it's going to work. Because um, you have to configure it pretty much by scratch. <laughs> so, um, this guide does do, it does a really nice job. It, you know, it, it tells you exactly how to install a kernel from binary, from source. Um, and it tells you the exact commands to use so it's not um it's not hard in the sense of installing it it's hard in the sense of configuring it properly to make sure that uh, it it works you know the exact way that you want it to work all right so the kernel just got uninstalling and now we need to make a symbolic link to that kernel that way when programs get installed 
it knows that a kernel is on the uh, the system. The way that we do that is we do the eselect command again, kernel list, and now you can see that this eselect kernel list it will show um, a the kernel that we're using. Okay, um, and we have the star there. That also means that this is the kernel that's active and if we do an ls lah user source linux you will see user source linux actually points to linux 6.131 which is the kernel that we are currently using um, make sure that user source linux um, directory is actually there okay so the pretty much the the uh, the guide here or the handbook rather um, it tells you an alternative you can use the gen kernel you can go ahead and read that to figure out you know which kernel is right for you um, but like I did say earlier I I personally just use the binary kernel okay um, also. If you do have some kind of weird licensing issues and everything, just understand that this Linux firmware package, um, you do need the binary redistributable re um, license, um, and it tells you how to accept that license as well. Um, but because we accept all licenses earlier, we don't really have to deal with that. Um... So this goes over the manual configuration, which is Gen2 sources, um, and it tells you that you can install this PCI utilities package, um, which is a good package to install anyway, um, but this package will kind of help you figure out what is running on your system uh, as far as drivers and all of that, and then... This will tell you uh, pretty much what you need um, in order for it to boot. There's a lot of stuff here, guys. Also understand that this book, this book is a little, the handbook is a little outdated. Um, I mean, it has most things, but the kernel is always evolving. Um, and the kernel has pretty much evolved further than what this book shows. Or what this handbook shows. So if you're going to do a custom kernel, like I said, make sure you actually do your homework. Because if you do a custom kernel and it doesn't boot, well now you got to, you know, you got to root back in. You got to do it again. And um, yeah, it can become a headache. Um, personally on my system, like I said, I, I'm not going to lie, I use a binary kernel. And all my hardware, I, I got newer hardware and uh, everything just works. Now, I have to use the 6.1 6 uh, kernel or 6x kernel. Um, I can't use any of the 5 kernels. But, um, yeah, they, they, they work. So, we don't have to really worry about kernel modules or anything like that. Um... Like I said, some of these things you're gonna have to, uh, you know, if you if you had to um, set up a module to get your network card working, for instance, uh, then it pretty much goes over how to uh, how to auto load that information in. We don't really have to worry about that, so um, we are going to skip that. We're going to go on to configuring this system here. Um, so we're going to do. Um, the fstab or fstab, um, however you say it, <clears throat> what fstab does, this will, um, this will tell the dr what drives to auto mount at boot time. Okay, um, now you can do this kind of two different ways. There's an, a kind of advanced way. So if we do ls block. There's a way to show your uh, UUID, and I forgot the I forgot the command. Um, so there is a there's a different way to um, 
to show that. I don't know the exact command right off bat. We're not going to use it anyway, but if you did want to use uh, UUID to set your uh, FS tab, there is there is a there is a way. I, I do it on my uh, on my system here. Um, I don't understand. Is it? Oh, it's block ID. Okay, so there we go. Um, so if you do block ID the block ID command, um, the UUID will show, and then you can use that in your F FS tab. We're not really going to be doing that, but um, you can do that if you wanted to. So, we need to set up a uh, FS tab, so the way we do it, nano, etc, FS tab, okay? Um, and this gives you, uh, you know, it, it shows you pretty much how to set this file up. Um, the big one is going to be UEFI for um, for boot. So we're going to do boot. Make sure this says VFAT for boot. Defaults. And then 0, 2. And then we have dev SDA2. I believe this is swap. No, this is none, and then this is going to be swap. Okay, and then zero, zero, and then for root, we did extend four. We can do no A time, and we can also do right here, we can do SSD. Um... If you have an SSD, it's a good, it's a pretty good idea to set this SSID flag right here for your boot. Um, I'm actually going to, let me pull up a terminal on my actual system so I can tell you the exact, um, the exact way that um, I did it. Just to help you guys out a little bit. Um. So the way I did it on my system is I did uh, I did SSID and then I did defaults. Um, so we can do SS I mean SSD sorry SSD and then defaults and then I had this one zero right there. Now I don't know what these numbers represent, but um, you can read about all of that type of stuff. Um, but if you do have an SSD, it's a pretty good idea to, uh, to set that. Now, because I'm running this in a virtual machine, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to set that, but if we was on actual hardware, then, uh, then I would. Okay. All right. And you can also set up anything else that you need to have automatically mount at boot time right there. Next thing we need to do is some network information. Okay, so we do we can do echo. Uh, we can echo. I'm just going to call this Gen2 BERT. Okay, and then ETC hostname. Now, what ETC hostname is, that's the hostname of your computer, okay? So, um, if you've ever seen someone pull up a terminal or whatever, and it says, Chris at whatever, you know, uh, some kind of weird name, like, I call my computer ghostly, um, but you can have it set whatever you want, um, that's, um, that's what a hostname is. Um... And now we need to emerge DHCP CD. The reason we need this is because we need to be able to pull up. Um, we need to be able to connect to the uh, to the internet when we reboot. Okay. Now we need to do this RC update add. DHCP CD D 
default what this is going to do is this is going to add it to the default run level so that way when your computer is uh when your gen 2 is booting up um it will automatically launch uh dhcp cd it's a service okay um and the handbook actually says go ahead and start the service we don't need to start the service because it's already started all right we, we started the service earlier um so you don't have to worry about that um we do need we need this net um this net ifrc package so no replace uh net misc net IFRC, okay. Next thing is we need to configure our conf.d net, okay. So we need to figure out what our network device name is. Mine is ENP1SO. We need to remember this, okay. And now we need to do nano config.d.net. And then config ENP1SO um, equals DHCP. So as you can see, most of this, I'm just following the uh, the guide here. Um, but what this file pretty much does is it's telling DHCP, it's telling your network, uh, I mean your network uh, interface that you're going to be using DHCP. And then uh, the documentation also has something in case that you wanted to use static IP um, as well. Um, we're not doing static. We're doing uh, DHCP, which is dynamic host. <clears throat> so we can do change directory etc init.d. Um, and now we need to do minus. We need to make a symbolic link from our net.lo device, which is the loopback device. And we need to make that. We need to symbolically link that to our actual uh, network device. So for me, it's net.enp1so. I'm going to check that again. It is. Okay. Um, and you can type in ipconfig again to, to look that up. Okay. Um, now, the book says use use ETHO, that's wrong, okay? ETHO is the way that it used to be done, but um, now, these days, um, most of your uh, Ethernet devices or whatever, um, they're ENP something. Um, so, like I said, the, uh, the, the book is a little outdated, uh, but it does tell you right here in this section right here to supplement the ETHO for your device okay uh, and then we need to RC update add net ENP default okay now what we're doing is we're telling our network interface hey we want you to uh, we want you to start up at uh, at boot time okay the next thing we need to do is nano etc host okay we need to set some host name information here okay and then we can just do um i just do gen2 vert um again play around with this file if you if you need to um this is just setting up host name stuff and host all right so the next thing that we need to do is we need to set up our root password by default gen2 does not come with sudo okay so we need to set up a password for root it does need to be a good password too okay so do password um Next couple of things is we can do, um, we can edit these RC, this RC dot configuration file. We don't really need to do that, okay? 
we also don't need to do uh, anything with the key maps. Um, you may want to check out the key map um, just to verify that the key map that you need to use uh, works correctly. Okay, but by default, the US key map, um, that will be the default when we reboot. Also, the hardware clock. If you are dual booting with Windows, if you're dual booting with Mac or any other operating system, um, there's a chance that you have hardware um, hardware clock like skew. Okay, what that pretty much means is that your hardware, I mean your clock, um, is um, kind of off sync a little bit. Okay, uh, so you may you may need to set the um, the variable in there for um, to local instead of uh, UTC, I believe. So if I do config the hardware clock, as you can see, we're using UTC, but it tells you right here that, hey, if you're dual booting with Windows or any of those operating systems, you may need to set this to local um, just so you don't have uh, clock problems. <clears throat> All right, the rest of this is system D type of stuff. Now we need to install some tools. Okay. Um, we need a system, um, system log tool. So we do app hyphen admin syskLogD. Now you can use any kind of system logger that you want. This is the one that, um, it just recommends. But there's many more that you can choose from. We can do RC update add syskk log d default. Okay. And that's going to add our system logger to the default run level. Now, this talks about a cron Damien. What is a cron daemon? Well, a cron daemon is like a, um, it's like a scheduler, um, okay, so you can schedule it to do, like, certain stuff at a specific time. For instance, if you, if you update your system, um, every day at the same exact time, you know, no matter what, well, then you could probably mess around with a cron daemon and to have that do it for you automatically, I'm going to skip installing a cron daemon just because this is a uh, this is a VM. I'm not going to use that. But if you're doing this on actual hardware and you think that you may eventually use a cron daemon, then feel free to uh, install one. Uh, we can do some file indexing stuff. So uh, we'll actually install this program here. Um, now, this will allow you to use the, um, I think it's the locate command or mlocate command. Um, this is a pretty helpful command if, you, if you're unfamiliar with the, uh, the terminal and how to use the uh, actual locate. Um, but we do need to... We do need to update db here, so it it generates a uh, index, and then we could do locate. Yeah, so locate is now installed. Um, if you need SSD or I mean open SSH, sorry, um, then you can also install it here as well. Um, So, if you if you need SSH, then you can start the uh, the service or whatever, so you can have SSH asset access on your system. Um, again, we're running a VM. I'm not really going to be SSHing in to this system. Uh, time synchronization. We will be installing this program here. Okay, um, it's very important to. Uh, Keep your time sync correct. Um, there is other different uh, time sync programs. There's network time protocol. There's there there's a bunch of different ones. Um, this is just the one that it recommends. Um, 
with the uh, handbook and it seems to be a small little program so uh, it's just the one that I personally uh, I personally use um, so we can do RC update add crony D default and then you can see we made it in the default running level right there and then we need file system tools okay by default um e2 e2fs progs will be installed but i you know i always make sure that it is um all right i make i make sure it's installed um it, they say in the handbook that you don't need to install it if you made a um a file system that was extend for or whatever um but I, I just always personally do now if you made a system that is riser fs xfs jfs beat butter fs um you do need to install the appropriate uh sys file system um stuff and then another thing i always like to make sure i have is sys fs and then dos fs tools okay so now it's going to ask you to install dhcp cd we actually did this earlier um they need to update this handbook because we we did that much earlier uh ppoe client now we we're not going to be installing this because no one uses dial-up anymore. Why they even have this on here, I, I have no idea. Uh, all right, wireless. Okay, so if you use a wireless card or if you use wireless in any capacity, um, you need to install um, the um, net wireless... Uh, net wireless... Uh, IW and you also need to use WPA supplicant and I also recommend that you install wireless tools so that would be merge AV wireless tools okay um, now we're not going to be installing that because I use Ethernet but for those of you that use wireless I do recommend that you uh, install those okay <laughs> next thing up is the bootloader as soon as the uh it goes here grub okay before we install grub for those of us that are that is using efi okay we need to echo this command out okay um so we need a grub plat forms equals efi 64 etc portage dot make okay what this per, uh, what that echo command will do is it's going to tell it's going to tell make configuration file that we want to make sure that we enable efi 64 support for grub okay that way when we go to install grub it will pull down efi support um now if you're not using efi and you're using uh you know um the dos partition uh table you don't need to worry about that but for most of us unfortunately we're using efi these days um sis All right. Bridge make big. Oh. All right. It's complaining right here because we put an extra thing. So. So now you can see that grub. When we go to install grub, grub is going to pull down that EFI uh, variable as well as EFI boot manager. Now. A couple of different things that we can do with grub. Okay. Um, you can do the you can enable device mapper um, and mount. 
also you if you are dual booting with windows or if you're dual booting with mac there's an additional program that you might want to install after this and i'll show you how to set that up okay um by default grub it doesn't pull in the package to probe a another um another operating system okay so we actually have to we have to install that package we have to edit grub before we install it if we want like uh if we want dual boot uh support and i don't believe that the handbook actually tells you how to do that um I'm going to look here. No, I don't think the handbook actually tells you how to do this. Um, but I will show you guys because I know a lot of you guys, um, you know, some of you guys might dual boot with Windows. Some of you guys might dual boot with Mac. Okay. And um, so as soon as Grub gets done installing, we will install this package. And then, uh, all right, so you can see right here, you can see where Grub says dev lib, I mean, sysboot OS prober. That's the package that we need, okay? So we do emerge ab sysboot. OS Prober. Okay. Now we run into our first little issue, right? Now, I did this kind of on purpose. Alright. So remember earlier how I said that we can set specific use flags per package, right? Well, in order to use this OS Prober, in order to install this package... It depends on Grub having mount support, okay? We didn't install Grub with mount support, but we can add it, re-emerge it, and then it will. So you can see right here, it says OS Prober, it requires, it requires Grub 2.06 to have mount, right? And you can see Grub right here, Right now, Grub doesn't have mount, okay? This is saying, hey, we're going to add mount when we install it. In fact, if we did, uh, if we looked at Grub, you can see Grub, right? Um, when we emerge Grub, Grub does not have mount support. You can see that minus mount. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to add mount support to Grub, re-emerge it, and then OS Prober will... It'll work um, as it should, okay? So the way that we do this is we could do echo. And then we can do uh, sys boot grub 2.06 r6 mount, okay? So what this is saying, okay, what this is saying is greater than or equal to grub 2.06 add mount support okay so just like in uh, basic math class okay you got the greater than and equal to the greater than and equal to is telling which version of the package okay so it's saying greater than or equal to grub 2.06 so when 2.07 comes out and you go to upgrade your system you're going to have that mount support in okay that's all that means now the next thing is we need to um, we need to have this write to package dot ex, um, package dot use keywords. Okay, this is a use keyword, and this is a per package. Now we could put mount in our uh, make configuration file, but um, I don't like to make my make configuration file big. Okay. So we can do package.use, okay, and then we can do grub, 
That's it. Okay. And what this is going to do, if we cat etc portage package.use grub, if we cat this, that's all we wrote to it with that echo command. Now watch what happens though when we try to install OS OS Prober. OS Prober is now satisfied and it's going to re-emerge Grub with mount support. Okay, I hope that makes sense. I do have a video, like I said, here on the channel. Check it out uh, where I go over use flags and um, how you can use them and, and everything like that. Okay, um, but just understand that if you're going to be using Gen 2, um, really, really try to understand what use flags are. Okay, because it's it's a big part of what sets Gen 2 aside from some other distributions. Okay, so now that we got OS Prober installed, we need to configure Grub in order to to pick it up. There's an also another thing. Okay, and if you read this, so if it says if you intend for OS Prober to to detect versions of Windows installed on NTFS formatted partitions, which by the way, any version of Windows that you install, more than likely you installed it as an NTFS partition. We also need to install this NTFS 3G package, okay? So let's go ahead and configure Grub, and then we'll install that NTFS 3G package before we actually uh, configure uh, configure Grub. So we can do nano. And this tells you exactly where to put it. Um, where to put this Grub disable OS prober equals false. So it's default Grub. Okay, so we go all the way down, all capital letters, grub, disable, I can spell, underscore OS, prober, equals lowercase false, okay? By default, grub.disable OS prober is set to true that's why we needed to make it false. We also now need to install that NTFS 3G package. Okay. Now, I'm just doing this for the fun of it because this is a virtual machine. I don't have any other operating systems installed. But I know, like I said, I do know quite a few of you guys will. So... This is something that you do need. Uh, now, if you're just dual booting with Linux or anything like that, I don't think you need that NTFS 3G um, package. Um, but you still need to do the OS Prober uh, stuff. Okay? So now, what we need to do is we need to actually install Grub as our bootloader. Okay? So Grub is ready to go. So we do Grub install. Target uh, equals x86 64 hyphen EFI EF, EFI directory equals boot. All right. So if everything goes well, this will install. Uh, this will install Grub. Enter our EFI directory. Installation finished. No errors reported. That's probably... This is the most intense thing when you install Grub, okay? <laughs> because without Grub, you can't really boot your system. Well, you can, but... Um, there is... It's, it's more complicated. Um, now, if you are using BIOS instead of GRUB, I mean, instead of uh, EFI, the only thing you need to do is this command right here, GRUB install slash dev slash SDA, okay? Um, the only, um, for us EFI people, um, we have to use this specific command right here. But both of them do the same exact thing, they install GRUB. Um, Okay, now we need to run the grub make configuration file. Okay. 
boot grub grub grub.cfg okay during this process if you have if you had another uh part like if you had another operating system on your computer like if you had windows or if you had mac or if you had uh other linux um operating systems this is exactly where you would see os prober find those operating systems okay um now like i said in the beginning this is a uh, virtual machine so i don't have one but this is exactly where uh you would now going over to God, this is configuring Lilo. Lilo is another. Um, it's another. Uh, it's like Grub, but it's a lot older and it's super super slow. Um, and then there's an alternative, which is EFI Boot Manager. Never used that one either, and I probably wouldn't. Um, that's it. That that's pretty much the the, the install. Uh, if you made it this far and you um, did everything correctly. Congratulations. Um, we can exit the system now. Okay. We can CD. We can unmount. Um, mount Gen2 Dev. CHM. PTS. Uh, unmount, you mount, R, mount, Gen 2, okay, and we reboot, and if we reboot, hopefully we boot up into our system. There's Gen 2, and there we go, there's our system. So, it's really not hard to install Gen 2 Linux at all, okay? You just follow, follow the uh, book. Now, we log in as root. So, we got the base install done. Gen 2 is installed. Everything is working. Let's, we do if config. Okay, we have network stuff. We can, let's ping, the, ping whatever, google.com. Okay, we have network. We're good. We're connected. Where do we go from here, right? What's the what's the next step? Well, the next step, probably for many of us, is getting a user set up, okay? Because we're not going to run everything as root. Um, and for a lot of us, we want to install X, okay? We 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 want a graphical environment, um, okay? So let's uh do the finalization. Let's go ahead and get a user set up, and then I'll show you how to set up X, okay? Um, so for user, we can do, let me make sure it, okay. We can do, we can do user add, okay. We can do M, G, G is for groups. Uh, M means make a new user. Um, I believe that's what the M flag does. So we do users, wheel, uh, audio, and we also need video, okay? The, the the handbook doesn't say video, but you you do want video. Also, you want to make sure that you're in the wheel group, okay? That is very important. Without being in the wheel group, you won't be able to SU unless you install sudo or sudo, whatever, okay? Um, and you want to be able to... Uh, ask you for super user privileges to be able to install packages okay and then minus s is for um shell and then bash okay and then we type in our user mine's chris so it just did that okay so we could do we could exit now oh well we gotta set the password that was my fault um doesn't come with the uh, default password. We have to set that. And I mistyped my root password. Go figure. Okay, and then we do password Chris. Um,
it was griping at me because uh, <laughs> I tried to put in a uh, not a not a good password. Um, that's okay. We can offset a uh, legit password. Oh my god! Can I type? Um, what? Uh, let me set something. There. It, it worked that time. It wants you to set a good, good password. Um, it will complain, which is a good thing. All right. But we logged in. Okay. So now you might be asking, well, hey, we don't have sudo installed. How do we get root access? Right. Well, most of you guys are pretty used to sudo. I don't use it. Um, so, so us people that have been using Linux for a very long time, it's just simply the SU command. Okay. You type in SU, type in your root password, not your password, and you will get sudo or you'll get root um, access. All right. So next thing we need to do is we need to set up. Um, we need to set up X, right? So how do we set up X? Well, go to Google or whatever uh, search engine you want to use, and then you can just do Gen two X X org, right? There's a guide right here. Click it. It's going to tell you exactly what to do. Um, Okay, so right here it says in your make configuration file we need to have this use.x set up. Okay. So we do nano etc portage make conf use x. Set that up. Okay. We also need to have this video cards variable set up, okay? Um, and our input devices. So, this is all going to be depending on what, um, what's, what's in your system, okay? Uh, for me, video card, I forgot which one actually uses, because um, I'm using... I'm using a weird driver because I'm on a, um, a thing. Um, I'm on a virtual machine. I do need to figure out what driver I'm actually using here. Um, so let me leave full screen. I need, I need to look at this real fast. Um, I'm using QXL. Okay, that's fine. So I can do Q, I can do Q, XL, and then we also need to do, um, input devices, um, and this is going to be lib input, okay? Um, there's also something else called e-log IND. We need e-log IND. Okay, this is, um, I think it's like a policy kit or something. Um, we need this and we need dbus. So so we need to do e-log IND, okay, and then dbus. Um, you need to have that set in your use configuration. E-log IND, okay? Um, and when it installs, we need to have that uh, set to uh, default run level. That's something else that the, the book doesn't really tell you to do. But right here, you can look at some uh, default use flags for X. Okay. And right here, E-log IND. E-log IND to control over frame buffer. Okay. So it's frame buffer control as a regular user. But I believe you still want to, uh, you, you want to install it. Um... Okay, so next thing is installing X. Um, so we do X11 base uh, X org. All right. 
So we got X installed here. Okay, so we should not need anything else. Um, I'm going to check on the E-Log IND package, though. E-Log IND uh, Gen 2. Yeah, we do need to run it at the boot um, running level, okay? Um, RC update add e-log ind boot, okay? So that's at the boot running level. Next thing we can install is, I told you guys, we were just going to install XFCE. Um, so we can, we can install XFCE. So right here, it's telling us that we can un avoid some unnecessary dependencies because um, XFCE is going to try to pull in this pop uh, popper package, and we can tell the system to not use QT, uh, QT5 on popper. So we might actually do that just to uh, just to save time. Uh, if you guys do need QT5 for any reason, then feel free not to do this. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do this. Uh, add QT5 to my to this virtual machine here. Um, but just understand this is this is what I'm actually doing. Is uh, I'm telling the system here don't use QT5. Or don't, uh, I'm telling Poplar, don't use uh, QT5 when you go to install. Okay. So we can do, we can go ahead and just install this meta package right here. So. I can do emerge av xfce hyphen base xfce4 meta. So many packages this is going to be. Say no here. We need to echo this um, dev hyphen libs lib dbus menu 16.04.0 r2 gtk3 um portage package dot use into lib dbus menu this is going to tell that lib dbus menu 1604 uh to use gtk3 and now it should not complain anymore. Okay, so you might run into this too. So what's going on with this is... There's a dependency issue with... Um, I guess like pulse audio and um, lib sin file. Okay, so what we can do actually is nano etc portage make uh, make dot com. Okay, just get rid of that pulse audio in our uh, use flag here. And hopefully it won't complain. See, now it's not going to complain. So that fixed the uh, that fixed the issue. Here's a uh, weird dependency issue. Um, sometimes you'll run into that where it's like one program doesn't the program you're trying to install 
say the program that you're trying to install installs two dependencies, right? One dependency doesn't like the other dependency. <laughs> um, that doesn't happen a lot, um, but um, it does happen every once in a while. So I'm going to let this install. I'm going to bring you guys back when it gets done. We're going to be, uh, and then um, I'll set up uh, X and X in it, uh, X in it, I should say. Um, and then we will, uh, we'll reboot and then we should have X. So, all right. Well, we got XFC, XFCE4 installed. We need to add this XFCE4 session to our exonet um but first thing that we're going to do is we're going to get our root we don't want any kind of permission uh skew going on so we do uh make sure we are in our home directory we are okay so we do uh nano w make sure this is a hidden file here so x and it x init rc and then we do execute dbus hyphen launch xfce4 hyphen session okay and then we write that information out next thing that we need to do is we we need to reboot the system um so that way elog ind and dbus will start up automatically and then we should uh be able to start x after that and everything should work the way that uh it needs to okay so it's bringing everything up it did all that um press okay and now we should just start x and it should pop up there we go. XFCE. Now, some of you guys may be asking, hey, what is the next, what's the next step? Well, the next step, folks, is going to be up to you, okay? That is as far as I'm taking this video. So, in this video, we started from scratch. We installed Gen 2. Um, and we got xorg up and running i do apologize about the length of this video but this has been a uh <laughs> it's been quite a lengthy process for myself as well um i'm gonna try and edit a lot of this video down um but don't be surprised if this video isn't three hours long uh, like i said i do apologize about that it's just that's just the way that um one of these type of videos is going to be um i'm also going to try to put chapters down below so some of you uh advanced users you guys can kind of skip around to the sections that you may need a refresher on um but for all you new users new gen 2 users um do watch the video okay pause it play it pause it play it okay but if you really do want to uh, install Gen 2 and, and learn about it a little bit, then uh, I, I really do advise you to watch the entire video. Um, also, I do have some Gen 2 specific videos here on the channel that go over use flags. Um, it goes over the uh, make configuration file. Okay, it also goes over, um, I have a video going over how you can set up Git instead of rsync. Um, so do check those videos out and, uh, yeah, tell me your thoughts. Um, also tell me your thoughts on this video. Did, um, do you think I did enough? Do you, do you think that, um, this is a pretty good, the way I, uh, I did everything was, uh, pretty good. Um, but feel free to leave me a comment and, uh, get, please give me a like. I, I would really appreciate it. And, uh, till next time you guys take care. Be safe and peace. Bye, guys. Thanks for watching.